230 or 237 physicians who signed the statement that they want to back uh, 200 and 300. Thank you. Hello, I'm Steve Somerville, and I, as he said, I'm a pediatrician. I am the medical director at the nursery over at St. Mary mm -hmm. Corwin, and I want to tell you what I'm seeing uh, with the uh, uh, recreational marijuana. We currently uh, deliver uh, about 7 to 10 percent of our babies any given month are exposed to THC, test positive. Uh, that's not a mother who admitted to smoking during pregnancy, that's we found THC in 7 to 10 percent of our babies. Uh, what does that mean when you find THC in a baby? Well, first of all, let's talk about the marijuana. Uh, in the 70s, when they first started looking at what does prenatal THC mean, uh, they looked at mothers who exposed their babies to marijuana. That marijuana was 2.5 percent THC. Our current marijuana is 15 percent. So it's a seven-fold increase in the concentration of the, the THC that our babies are being exposed to. But back then, in the 70s, we knew that if a baby was exposed prenatally to marijuana, they would see decreased school performance. They would have difficulties in spatial reasoning. They would have difficulties in problem solving, difficulties in short-term memory. And they would be less likely to graduate from high school. And they would be, um, uh, have what we suffer from what we call uh, academic underperformance, meaning they should have more potential, but they don't live up to it. That was with the 1970s THC. We don't know what it means now, OK? We know what it means for teenagers who smoke marijuana. It means they have exactly the same thing, and they acquire these same issues. Uh, decreased spatial reasoning, decreased school performance, decreased IQ. Um, and uh, it's a very interesting that you find the same things in the teenagers exposed to, t to THC that you found in the newborn babies down the road. As our knowledge progressed about neurodevelopment, uh, we've learned several things. One of the most important things we've learned is that the brain doesn't actually finish developing until the late 20s. So when your brain is, when you, you say that people are adults making adult decision making at 18 or 21, that's not true. The prefrontal cortex is the last part of the brain to mature, and that doesn't happen until 25 to 30. So um, what does that mean during that period? What does it mean for the prefrontal cortex to mature, it means that uh, the neurons that live in that part of the brain are reforming their connections into the final connections uh, that are going to characterize mature adult decision making. Um, and that happens late in life, or late in uh, young adulthood. Um, pre, uh, that cortical remodeling, or pruning we call it, also is occurring in the newborn period. It turns out that THC, in particular, unique, may be unique among the cannabinoids, but uh, we don't know enough about the other ones because we only study THC because it's the funnest one. Um, the uh, THC seems to interfere with this process of cortical pruning. Uh, we know that the, we know of two types of uh, cannabinoid receptors, CB1 and CB2. CB1 is in the nervous system, CB2 is in the immune system. CB1 appears to be involved in the remodeling of the brain. Okay? It's also involved in interpreting painful stimuli, interpreting pleasurable stimuli. We don't fully understand CB1, but it is clearly involved somehow in the way we, we prune our cortex. So we find that um, uh, when you look at teenagers who smoke marijuana, uh, that uh, the prefrontal cortex is indeed abnormal. Okay? Does it ever normalize? We don't know but we know that they develop, acquire an abnormality in the prefrontal cortex, and they subsequently, studies just came out from the Scandinavia, um, that talk about that prefrontal cortex, uh, or talk about decision making, poor decision making amongst moderate users of marijuana, uh, having a higher increase of death by an accident before age 60, by 40%. So in Scandinavia, if you smoke marijuana as a moderate amount as a teenager, you're 40% more likely to die in an accident by six, by the time you're 60. You never have to smoke marijuana again. You just have to be a moderate smoker when you're a teenager. So that decision making, that prefrontal cortex injury, seems to persist throughout your life. All right? Um, let's go back to the babies. So we know there's these structural abnormalities that happen in teenagers. Well, we know there's behavioral issues that happen in babies that we've been able to document back in the 70s. 
Uh, recently, some studies have just came out doing neurological imaging of newborns who were exposed to moderate amounts of uh, marijuana in pregnancy. And let's talk about what that means. What's a moderate dose of marijuana? Moderate means three joints per week, okay? So when you, know, when you think of a moderate marijuana smoker in Colorado, do you think of someone who smokes three joints per week? All right. So uh, a mother who smokes three joints per week, uh, um, uh, and you, then you look at her baby, the neuroimaging of that child, eight years later, they have abnormalities in their hippocampus and their prefrontal cortex. Uh, their structural, their prefrontal cortex are both failed to mature in the same way as a person who was never exposed to marijuana. Uh, these abnormalities exactly correlate with the domains where we see the weaknesses in their performance. Okay. So, 7%, let's say on the low end, 7% of our babies are now being exposed to marijuana. Those babies have a high risk of having abnormal brains with a hippocampus and prefrontal cortex, which is going to be perhaps permanent. We know it persists at least eight years. Um, that's one in 14 births that this is happening in, when you think about that. Okay. Every 14 births, somebody's born with a preventable brain injury. Um, do we really want that, okay? Um, the other thing you need to think about when we think about retail marijuana is, why are these babies being exposed? Um, when you talk to the mothers, why did you smoke marijuana? Uh, when you have retail marijuana available and you have the marketing strategies that have been employed in Pueblo, you have a kind of a pseudo-medicalization of the marijuana. So mothers become nauseated. Marijuana is natural. They don't like to be nauseated. Marijuana has a, is rumored to prevent nausea. And they use it in cancer patients, so it must be good. And so they'll start experimenting with marijuana. Uh, we frequently see, on the other side, in the OB side, mothers who have the hyperemesis uh, of cannabinoid use syndrome, um, uh, where the marijuana is actually causing the nausea, uh, but that just increases the exposure because that's a very counterintuitive thing for someone to think of, is that my, my anti-nausea drug is causing my nausea, so they'll just keep using it. Um, um, and so um, you have these conversations where these mothers are using a drug that's readily available. They don't need to get professional advice. They can just walk into the retail store, uh, get something for nausea, and then expose their babies to potentially uh, further harm. Um, on the teenage side, I talked a little bit about what I see with teenagers, uh, what the risk for teenagers are. Uh, um, I think. As I'm learning today, there's some uh, advocacy, parents advocacy groups that can tell you much more strongly what the risks for teenagers are. Uh, some of the short, on the short list, which I think is probably one of the most pertinent things, is if you have no history of psychiatric disease in your family and you smoke marijuana as a teenager, you're twice as likely to have a, uh, some sort of psychotic outburst as a teenager who never smoked marijuana. If you have a history of psychotic disease in your family, the, the risk goes up five to seven fold. So um, that's an issue. What I see in the, in the hospital is even more heartbreaking, and that is there's been a dramatic increase in the attempted suicides at my hospital. I don't know if, uh, the other side of town. Uh, and the thing that's unique in the suicides that I see, um, uh, typically in the past, my suicides were associated with alcohol and Tylenol. Um, all my suicides, only one did not test positive for THC this year. Um, and that one was a chronic uh, uh, a person who had a very poor control of depression and was overwhelmingly uh, sick. Uh, but every other teenager uh, who attempted suicide was THC positive. Um, do I have enough evidence to say that THC caused this? No, but I think it's a striking correlation that my suicide attempt rate goes up by fivefold and they're all positive for THC. Um, uh, I don't really have anything else to say except uh, if you want um, to continue to have legalized marijuana in the state, uh, given the fact that we know that it affects brain remodeling and we know brain remodeling continues into your late 20s, is it really makes sense from a point of view to have marijuana available to 21 year olds? Um, if you really want to continue to have it here, um, should we make it 30, 35? before we make it legal. <laughs> <laughs>
uh, that brings us to a close, I think. Come out wrong. Won't you help us, please? Help us just to sing along a new redemption song. A new redemption song. Lord, we need a new redemption day. To bring redemption day To bring redemption day to come out wrong Won't you help us please Help us just to sing along A new redemption song A new redemption song